Welcome to Italian Innovators, I'm Luca Cottini, and today I'm in the company of Vic Rallo, restaurateur and wine critic. Uh, he owns and operates two restaurants in New Jersey, uh, Birra Vino in Red Bank and Undici Taverna Rustica in Ramsam, uh, which have received numerous awards uh, for excellence in cuisine, service, and wine lists. Uh, he's an Italian wine expert and critic, recognized for his exceptional palate and distinct personality. Uh, he's published two wine books, uh, Napoleon Wasn't Exiled, and 21 Wines. And lastly, he is the host of his own television series called On the Road with Vic Rallo, which is a fascinating journey through Italy's wine and food excellencies. So welcome, Vic. It's really a great honor to have you in the show. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, thank you for asking me to come on. Uh, Sounds like a great project that you've embarked in. So I'm glad I could be a part of that. Fantastic. So today we'll talk about Italian wine and food from an American perspective and about wine as both a business and a thing of culture. Uh, now, as a restaurant owner, Italian food is quite a difficult category to start from, especially in the United States, where the word Italian can become terribly stereotyped or relate to many things that are something else than Italy. Uh, also Italians themselves will have a hard time calling their cuisine Italian. They will rather go with regional characteristics like you know, Roman cuisine, Umbrian cuisine, Sicilian cuisine. And sometimes also Italians have a very strict approach to tradition, which might prevent new culinary creations. Now, what makes a restaurant in Italian, in your opinion, and what makes food Italian in your understanding? So, it, you know, Clearly, you're 100% correct. If we go to Italy and we travel through Italy, and like you, I've been to all 20 regions of Italy, I've drank the food and eat, drank, eaten the food and drank the wine. And in, in Italy, they say that the cuisine, the wine, even the dialect changes every five to 10 kilometers, right? So it's very, very regional. You know, ground zero in Italy is that place that time, what they grow, what they make, and what they drink. In the United States, it's much different. You know, we had uh, Italians that came to the United States, all over the United States, and let's just talk about the Northeast where we are, New York and New Jersey. Tons and tons of immigrants came from Italy to, to the United States and landed here. And unfortunately, the viewpoint of Italian food in the United States is much different. People view Italian food and they mosh everything together. So what they do is, you know, we might have a matriciana, you know, a pasta sauce from Rome, and they might have on the menu uh, rigatoni norma from Sicily or puttanesca from the South, another pasta sauce. And it all ends up together on a menu because that regional part of Italy, which makes Italy so unique, is gone in the United States. There's very few restaurants that are tipo Siciliana, uh -huh. Sicilian type or Umbrian type. It's usually a blend. So for me, how I work through that is because I think the greatest thing in Italian culture and Italian food and wine is that it's precise to that region and you eat what grows there. You drink what grows there. So seasonality is very, very, very important in Italian culture, in food and wine. So in my restaurants, we try to bring that through, right? So it's in the heart, we're in the dog days of summer now where there's tomatoes on the vine and fresh herbs are growing everywhere and corn and zucchini and eggplants and uh, you know, beans and peppers. So those should complement your menu. You know, if we're catching striped bass in the oceans in the local sea or black bass, those should be on your menu, right? We shouldn't be flying fishing from all over the world that's not fresh, right? Because Italy is, it's so particular about freshness and seasonality from where it is. And it's, it's really lost in the United States. So for us, the best way to do that is bring in Italian cheeses right? Aged cheeses and salami, salumi, everything we can Italian, and then complement it with the freshness of the season that we're in. Fantastic. So we, we were 
talked about it, you addressed it in, in this answer, but also in transporting a foreign culture into an American market, you might run the risk of importing it in a way too purely, so without mediation, and in the other way of diluting it completely in an, in an Americanized version. And I'm talking here about restaurants, but like the, the same applies to other categories. You mentioned cheese, and um, that's, that's a key category. So the problem is that like Italian import has a very, has a higher price point, uh, whereas counterfeits uh, have a much lower quality. So how do you avoid reductions and how do you in particular educate your customers to go beyond what they think they already know? And perhaps you can say something about the show as well, Ian, or yeah, also. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, so w what, what we do every day, and we spoke briefly about it is like, and I'll talk about just education in general. Every Friday, my brother and I are on, on the Beer Vino Facebook site. It's one of our restaurants and we do a Facebook Live. And because we can't be in Italy and Italians can't be here, we feel it's important to continue to educate our customers on Italian wine. Usually we have about 50 Italian winemakers a year pass through our doors, right? In the past four months, that's been impossible. So we have a Facebook Live where last week we were with um, Schiapetto, famous uh, white wine producer in Friuli. Uh, the week before, I think we were with Vietti from Piemonte and Odero from Piemonte and Tuscan producers all over the boot, right? Trying to continue that education. And people come in sometimes and they say, well, your prices are higher than X. Yes, they are higher than X. I agree with you. And we never fight with everyone, but we agree with them. And then the next thing is why, right? So the why part is the education part. So we have to continually educate people that if you're buying uh, Parmigiano Reggiano from Italy and or, that cost $8 a pound, and if you're buying a substitute from Argentina that costs $4 a pound, there's a difference. If we're using the Parmigiano Reggiano, it costs twice as much in the dish that we're making. And it may seem inconsequential, but it's not when you're making 1,000 or 2,000 of those a week, right? And the same thing with like imported lettuces from Italy. You can buy similar lettuces here in the United States that are delicious, but that bitterness, that authenticity is lost. So blending that, those lettuces in with a mix brings that Italian feel, right? to that salad, that Italian taste, which people go crazy for, right? If people are going on a vacation, the most, most visited place up until four months ago that Americans go on a trip if they're going abroad is to Italy. Why? Because they wanna feel that culture, that history, that food, that wine, the architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to give that to them and it costs more money, right? But if you educate the people and they know that for $2 more, $3 more an entree or a salad, that they're getting authenticity, they're getting the real deal, people are willing to pay for it. But without education, people say, wow, this is overpriced. So it's a, it's a very, very fine line. And our job as Italian Americans in the restaurant world, you know, and for anybody, if you're selling Ferraris, right? They cost more money than a Corvette, right? Definitely. <laughs> because you know, arguably it's historic. It's, you know, it's one of the most famous cars in the world. If you buy an Italian violin, as we spoke from Cremona, where the violin history started, I was there, I played a Stradivarius that was priceless, right? The guy was looking at me like I was crazy because I told him I know how to play it. I looked at YouTube four minutes before and like learned how to hold it. And right, so, like when we're talking about that, you can buy a Chinese violin for $1,000 when a handmade violin from Cremona is 25 or 30,000. So it, it's really what you want and what you wanna buy. Do you want something that's historical, that's pure, that's true? Or do you want something that's fake, that's almost as good? For me, that purity and being an Italian American, I'm so proud that I can, that I can serve Italian products and people still come to us and we're very busy and look to us for as experts in Italian wine, food and culture. 
And definitely this touches upon like the characteristics of uh, Italian business of the success of Italian model, which is based, based on the premium level, on the quality level in, in various fields. You mentioned uh, violins, cars and, and food. And uh, this also relates to what you were uh, talking about uh, in relation to education and uh, definitely connecting your restaurant business with your show on, on the road with Vic, Vic Rallo is part of this. And now, imagine your trips to Italy as really a time of discovery or what you call la materia prima, the ingredients, the quality, the freshness, and also as a time of storytelling where you give relatively small businesses, Italian businesses, a window into the American market. So what are the rewards and the challenges of a direct relationship with Italian producers? And what is your experience um, in, in your experience, the most underestimated quality in the Italian food industry from this experience that you're having? Well, I, I'll tell you one thing that um, if you know somebody that's stubborn, go to, an, go to Italy and go to a small Italian producer and find someone that's older than me. I'm 56, so that generation from 50 to 75 that's still running the business and their children are involved and you want to talk about stubborn because you know the the biggest market for italian products generally is the united states of america and you know they look at you as a, a professional and an expert on on food wine culture history and then they say, how can I sell my products in the United States, a small guy? And I say, okay, I'm like, and let's just use a wine producer, for example. So I had this experience with a Sicilian wine producer, fantastic Sicilian wine from the lowlands of Sicily, uh, close to uh, Syracusa and um, in between Syracusa and... Uh, the town was Noto, N O T O. Yeah. Right. So his labels, I thought, were very Italian and didn't suit the American market, right? Americans on a shelf in a liquor store see with their eyes first, right? So if you put some obscure name or label like that, they don't, it's got to be recognizable, right? So I tell Italian producers all the time, Forget your ego, forget your ego, leave it at home, right? We have to make it a label that'll sell, that people know what they're buying. And oftentimes on any consulting that I've done with Italian wine producers on the back, I don't want it to say just who it's distributed by or whatever. I want to have a little history and I want to have the grape varietals listed so people can... The second thing people do besides look at the label, they turn to the back label, right? Mm -hmm. I want them to look at the back of the label and know what they're buying. And you cannot believe the challenge to get Italian producers to listen to what I have to say. They come up with this big marketing program. They change the label to the way they want it. The wine comes to the United States and they have a problem selling it because it doesn't fit in on the aisle. It doesn't look like everything else. It's the label that they want, but it's not the label that's going to sell. So that kind of that old world mentality where, listen, if, you, if I didn't change my restaurants over the past 30 years, I would be out of business, right? I had a friend that says, if you don't change, change you, you, you end up in the La Brea tar pits with the dinosaur bones, right? <laughs> I don't want to be a dinosaur and I don't want to be a bo I don't want to be the bones. I don't want to be something that people talk about. I want to be relevant, right? To be relevant, you have to change. And the hardest obstacle I've found dealing with small Italian producers is that unwillingness to change and they waste a lot of money and time until they realize they made the wrong decision when they can't sell a product or they have problems with a distributor with a product because they didn't package it properly. Also the ability to create a product as uh, a piece of content marketing, as a piece of design, uh, where the product itself needs to tell a story, needs to yeah. have you a know, visual look, component I, in order to be appealing. I consulted on this, this company they made uh, Parmesan Reggiano chips. They dried them. They were gluten-free. They got really hard. They had 
very low fat because a lot of the fat was cooked out and they were like a chip and they sold them in a bag. And the, the name of the thing was like chip it. I'm like, chip it. What the hell is that? Chip it. I'm like, it sounds like we're playing golf or I'm like, that is a horrible name for a great product. They came to the United States. They tried to sell them. The product was unbelievable. Could not sell it because there was no recognition of what was in the bag to the name. Right. And it said Pecco, uh, it said Parmigiano Reggiano chips on the, like in small letters. I'm like, you have it all backwards. Right. So now they've re, re, they're in the process of redoing the packaging and a relaunch of marketing in the U U.S. so they can sell it. So again, you know, it, it's funny, you know, Ita older Italian men and women are slightly stubborn and they have to get over that. Definitely, this is also related to the part of, uh, of the component of education that we're saying. What was the most surprising thing for you that you discovered? In Italy? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you a couple unique finds that I found along my way that were just interesting when I was doing the show. Um, I was in um, the cellar of Vietti, which is a very famous Piemontese Barolo producer. And I was with Luca Corrado, who is the third generation winemaker and owner of the estate. And we were walking through this, the estate and he took like a... a kind of like a metal stick you would use in a barrel to, to stir it. And he poked through, through this, looked like a cement wall and he broke it away a little bit. And behind the cement wall was old wine bottles. And during the Nazi invasion of Italy, the, the Germans came through their tunnels and stole and pilfered all the wine. So they knew that this was happening and they created fake walls in the winery. So they saved their very precious wine from being stolen from the Germans. And through that cave, there was secret doorways and stuff that you could pop up in like um, a manhole cover, a cover on the street in the middle of Castiglione Filetto. So a little village, you could escape the winery from the Germans. So like, You know, who would have thought that Hitler loved wine? And in his bunkers in right over the Italian border in Austria, he had um, wine cellars with amazing collection of wine. Similarly, I was in uh, Alto Adige. And even though Mussolini was an ally of Hitler, he was terrified of Hitler because of his power and his relentless abuse of that power. So throughout Alto Adige, uh, Mussolini built bunkers to save his troops if Hitler, if Hitler ever turned on them. And I happened to go to this cave and I was the first American to ever visit this cave, this bunker that was turned into a wine vault. And this Afinor of cheese, this cheese flavor, cheese, Flavor, flavorer and uh, ager rented this bunker from the uh, Italian government, Italian military. And we stopped the car and we walked and we walked. I said, where are we going? This guy, I'm never coming back, right? And we walked into this cave that was refrigerated and he used it to flavor and age cheeses. So like there's all kinds of scenes throughout Italy where we find things that, that Americans or even Italians as tourists and food and, and cheese and wine lovers never ever get to see. And that's the unexplored part of Italy that truly in that, that I'm enamored with, you know, those kind of situations. Definitely like a food that contains a story is way yes. more appealing. Yeah. And also uh, a food that or wine that is a treasure in itself. Uh, there's a lot of um, debate about, you know, how to, sustain a business like uh, Parmigiano Reggiano or w the wine business, which is a long-term business that invests on quality. They're like uh, the, the warehouses of like Parmigiano Reggiano are real um, yeah. deposits of treasures. <laughs> uh, and uh, so yeah, and people, and people don't understand like Parmigiano Reggiano, they sell thousands and thousands of wheels and the aging process, the warehouses, the temperature control to do all that aging to meet, 
to come to the US, it has to meet USDA standards. And then they have EU standards. So there's separate standards on aging for both all those products. Prosciutto, if you go to San Daniele, a Parma, to a, where they make prosciutto, there's, so the EU allows them to use fresh air and the temperature control is not so important because it's historic. But the stuff that comes to the U, uh, USA has to be a USDA inspected and temperature control is very important. So when you eat a prosciutto de Parma in Parma, let's say, and they cut it, you'll see that it's much more flavorful, nutty. It's much, it has a tender, a different mouthfeel because the aging process is more natural than that of the stuff that comes to the United States. And when you eat it there where they say, oh, the prosciutto is better in Italy. Yeah, it's better in Italy because the U USDA requirement makes them age it at a lower temperature. So it doesn't get all those tertiary characteristics that you would find in a prosciutto in Italy. And like, even as recently, when you go to Spain and you eat um, Ibirical ham, pata negra, mm -hmm. it, it's only been coming to the US for four or five years because they refuse to meet the USDA requirements to allow it to come to the United States. The same was with prosciutto de Parma. We've had it for 20 years, but it wouldn't come to the U.S. because the producers refused to change their process until they realized it was such a giant market that they needed to slightly change the process to meet USDA standards. Stephanie, and if we move this to the wine industry, um, I was wondering if you could tell something about how Italian wines make it to America, how they made it to America, how they make it to America, and how they... Uh, wine market in the US works for uh, Italian, Italian wine. So what are, what are the challenges that they have to face and what is their added value of, of an Italian label? Right. Sure, so, you know, in, in the early, late 60s and early 70s, the Americans and the world had no trust in Italian wines. And the reason they didn't have a trust is because you could not trust what was in the bottle. There was no standard. In the early 60s, late 70s, Italians adopted the French classification system. So they adopted a classification system governed by the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Finance. And that classification started with the typical table wine, IGT, Vino de Tavolo, DOC, DOCG, very similar to the French system. And with that system, what it, uh, it allowed international consumers to start to trust Italian wines. And what it meant was that if you bought the highest classification of wine, you knew that it was produced, bottled and grown on that estate. You knew it went through testing by the Ministry of Agriculture and a group of peers. And you knew that the Ministry of Finance gave a DOCG label around the capsule that said that they followed all of those rules. So basically, if you bought a good producer in the, the great years, because obviously vintage is important, you were, you were pretty much sure that you would get a decent or a very good bottle of wine. It wasn't till, until then that you started to get these very, very high level producers in Italy. With the advent of Italian wine, 1985, Sassicaia became was the first Italian wine to be red wine of the world unanimously through all of the var various journalists. That changed the perception of Italian wines forever. So now Italy is selling more wine in bottles in the 80s than they were in bulk. So Italy was selling bulk wine in giant containers, boats, trucking containers to Bordeaux, to Burgundy, throughout the world to blend because they had fantastic grapes but they had no history of putting it in a bottle. Now you see, even in Southern Italy, uh, Sicily, for example, in 2010 was the first year that they produced more wine in bottle than in bulk, which is amazing, right? Sicily is an island, the biggest island in the Mediterranean, and Sicily produces more wine than the whole state of California the whole country of New Zealand, right? So they produce a shitload of wine, right? So 
Italy, Sicily produces a wine, and now you can feel comfortable with great producers like Cos, COS, like uh, Mark de Grazia on Mount Etna, Terraniri, right? Uh, um, my family namesake, the Rallos, produced Donna Fugata. So there's a, a ton, but there's some great producers in Sicily. And what you're finding, the wines of Puglia, Sicily, Calabria, outstanding, outstanding, outstanding value because labor's a little cheaper and they're not as well known. When you cr cross below Tuscany, so you go to Tuscany and Chianti and Bulgari, the super Tuscans in Piemonte, and as you move your way up, very well known and the prices uh, are much higher than the Southern wines. So some of my favorite wines today are the wines of the South. Today, in my refrigerator, I have a rosé, which you need to have in summertime. I'm drinking Fiudo Montone, a natural organic farm. Um, the wine make, the owner's name skips my mind, but his wife, he married a very famous chef called uh, Melissa Mueller. Became very famous in New York City, and they, they, they make, tomatoes and pasito de pomodoro, pasta, grains, and organic wines, beautiful wines, Fiudo Montone, very well priced. So that's my rosé that's in my refrigerator. And then from Calabria, I'm drinking Ippolito from Chiro, a Chiro Bianco that's unbelievable, fresh, fruity, $15. Right, and I wouldn't have, I can drink whatever I want. I wouldn't have anything else in my refrigerator for the summertime. Acidic, fresh, right? Perfect with a piece of grilled fish, a salad, summer cuisine. So the wines of the South of Italy represent tremendous values. And some wines that can age, the wines of Mount Etna, pre phylloxera So phylloxera came through Europe and, and ruined the rootstock and a lot of the rootstock in Europe is American rootstock because American rootstock is resistant to phylloxera. But on the top of Etna, because of its altitude, phylloxera didn't hit. So you have these very old 50, 60, 70, 80 year old vines that are producing unbelievable grapes, small clusters uh, that can age 10, 15, 20 years. So I'm, I'm I'm very into the, the wines of the South, whites and reds, and I think they represent tremendous value for the American consumer. <laughs> Wine really is a, a very, very, very rounded product rooted in a particular soil and culture, as you were just describing, and also certainly territoriality is a key trait of Italian cuisine in general. Um, what do you look for in a wine? What, what memory, what culture, what understanding of the world does a wine carry? So I think wine is very interesting. So there's a famous French word called terroir. And they use that same word in Italy. There's no, there's no word, Italian word for terroir. And terroir means the place where it's grown that microclimate, the amount of rain, the soil, the sun exposition, the other things that grow there. So terroir is so important. And I think when you're drinking Italian wines, they should be where, like in, in, in Sicily, I personally don't wanna drink Cabernet Sauvignon from Sicily. I'm gonna drink Nero Diavolo because that's indigenous to there. Definitely. I wanna drink Catarato white grape from, it, from Sicily because that's, that's from there, right? Merlot grows there, Cabernet Sauvignon grows there, all those kind of international varietals, but I, I want the indigenous varietal. So when I open a bottle from Sicily, I wanna taste where it comes from. I don't want it to taste like Californian wines or French wines. I want it to be truly Italian. And I think the unique part of Italian wines is because the boot is so long and it crosses so many different longitudes, latitudes, longitudes, latitudes. Latitudes or longitudes? <laughs> longitudes, right? Latitudes. Latitudes, uh -huh. right? That every, every latitude, it's something different. So when we talk about Sicilian wines, we have very dark skin, blue eyed, 
people growing the grapes. And then when we go to Alto, Alto Adige, way up top, Trentino, we have Germanic, very white-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, that speak German or a dialect of Italian that we wouldn't even know. So I think that uniqueness in Italy is so unbelievable. And people say, could you ever get tired of Italy? No, no way, right? There's so many varietals. There's about 3,000 known varietals in Italy, grape varietals. How could I ever taste all of them? How could I ever pick all of them? How could I ever see all of those? Almost impossible. But, you know, my tip as I educate people is like, if you're going to Piemonte this time of the year, don't drink Chardonnay from Piemonte. Drink Nascetta, local grape variety. It's delicious. What, you know, if you're in Sicily and you want a red wine, drink Frappato. Never heard of him, right? It sounds like an Italian race car driver. Doesn't sound <laughs> great, right? Giulio Frappato just won the Indy 500, right? <laughs> but those indigenous varietals are what makes Italian great, right? If you're in Rome, eat a matriciana, eat cacio e pepe pasta. Don't eat that in Puglia. Eat whatever they're serving in Puglia, you know, uh, orecchietti with broccoli rabe, right? So if you go to eat Italy, eat where you are. And if you walk into a restaurant that everyone's speaking English, leave immediately, right? Because you're in a tourist place and it's like going to an Italian restaurant in New Jersey, right? Find <laughs> Great <local> suggestion. <laughs> right? Find the local place, right? And what I do in my show and whenever I go is I want to be in the local place. I want to be where no one speaks English. Right. I want to be the only guy in the place that speaks English. And I want to tell the waiter, serve me what everybody else is eating. Right. What, what the house is you serving. What, what the house is serving. And usually you, you get it, you get a great meal, you know, and it's like, it's, it's unbelievable. One of my great tips though, is if you're going to Rome and you're flying out of Rome that day, the next day, Drive to Frascati, 17 kilometers outside of Rome, mm -hmm. right? And it's up on the hill and you can see Rome, the lights at night, and you're outside of the Tangentale, all the roads that go in circles that take forever to get out of. And from there, it's a 17 kilometer, 15 kilometer straight drive to the airport, right? So if you have a rental car, it's super easy. And if you go to Frascati in the summertime, in the center of Frascati, they have all these food trucks and they're famous for porchetta, and they roast these big porchettas and they slice them and they put it on a roll with some dressing, whatever they put on it. And they'll serve you a local Frascati, very cold. And I am assured that if you're right, if you were there today in Frascati and you were eating that sandwich, it's about what is about four o'clock right now or 430, you would be one of the happiest people alive because why? You're eating and drinking what you should at that time and place. Definitely. And like those little tips make Italy unbelievable. So food is an element of uh, diversity, but also an element of, of distinction in the sense that it carries a distinct identity for each site. Uh, yes. it's, it's an excellence that tells the visitor that there is something different, something unique about that place. Where you are. And in a nation of capital cities, uh, food is really a marker of these distinctions, of these original distinctions. I'm going to tell you one of my other tips. This is one of my favorite Italian tips. And it usually costs me a pound a day. So if I'm there for a week, seven pounds, two weeks, 14 pounds, three weeks, 21 pounds. So my tip is, it's the tip of threes. So if I go somewhere to eat and they serve me something great, or if I go to a winery and they serve me a great glass of wine. I drink the first one for personal gratification for myself. The second one I drink because it's so good. And if something is that good, you should have another. Same with a bowl of pasta or a piece of cheese, whatever it is, I have another. And the threes, this is why the threes are important because the third one, you have a third. So if it's a bowl of pasta, yes, you're full, but you have a third. The third is for memory. 
and I call it food or wine memory because I don't know when I'm coming back there again. And if I'm sitting at home and I'm like, wow, that spaghetti with uh, Ricci De Marte uh, with uh, sea urchin was one of the best I ever had. I can go into that memory block in my brain and I can pull it back and it's almost like I can taste it again. So that's my tip of threes if you go to Italy. Three times, personal gratification. If it's that good, you always have two. And the third one's for memory. Definitely, also in Italian, the word sapere, to know, uh, coincides with the word sapere, which means to savor, and yes. to taste. And in the sense, the food carries a memory, a cultural meaning, as you were describing. Also wine, the terroir, as you, as you were mentioning right. earlier. Like, like my, my mouth was... My mouth was salivating thinking about that pasta in Sicily at this restaurant right at the port uh, with the Ricci di Mare. My, and, and it's just memory. It's a sense that you have. It's a, a memory of things that you have. You know, it's like they say a sixth sense. Like if you walk into a room and you're frightened, you know, you have that sense. Well, you also have that memory sense with food and wine. It's like something, it's something super special. And I rely on it a lot because, th you know, it's my profession, you know, like that memory of food and wine. And it's so, it's so vivid to me. You know, one of the best meals I ever had, I was in Campania and I was going to a buffalo mozzarella farm and we were making buffalo mozzarella and regatta with uh, the farmer early in the morning. On the way there, a, a woman was setting up a, like a produce stand and she had these giant peaches. So me and my friend Manuel stopped and we bought like six peaches and they were soft and ripe and we brought them in the car and you could smell them. And we arrived at the Buffalo mozzarella plant and we started making mozzarella and my friend Manuel, Manuel said to the gentleman we were making with, can we take some of the more warm ricotta? We have peaches in the car. Can we cut them and fill them with the warm ricotta? And it was about 10 a.m. in the morning and we cut the peaches and we took the warm ricotta and we cut them and we ate it with our hands. And the fat of the cheese with the sweetness of the peach, right? Perfect simplicity and perfect deliciousness, the acidity of the mozzarella and the fat and I was like, wow, can food get any better than this? And the answer is no, right? Today, you'll find that most chefs cook with no more than five ingredients. Why? Why? Because, and that's including salt and pepper. You, you should taste every ingredient, right? So the famous margarita pizza, right? It's buffalo mozzarella, tomatoes from San Marzano, and pizza dough, flour, right? <laughs> and maybe olive oil and basil, the five ingredients, right? Why? Because the perfect pizza, you can taste the dough, you can taste the sauce, you can taste the basil, the olive oil, and the cheese, right? That's a perfect pairing. If you're cooking with more than five ingredients, you're doing yourself an injustice because you can't taste the food or the food is inferior quality and you're covering something up. Definitely. We, we talked also in the episode of the show dedicated to Massimo Bottura, to the famous dish, the five ages of the Parmigiano cheese, where he yeah. really works on one ingredient, uh, unveiling really its, its potential. And, um, right. Now, what you were describing about the memory of wine is particularly interesting with regard to building a wine collection, uh, a wine cellar. Uh, yeah. it, it works in the same way as kind of building a library or building a gallery or a collection. We talked in another episode about uh, collecting cars. Um, and this is an act that implies uh, memory, as you were saying, but also critical judgment. Um, what is your criterion for building a wine list? Right, yeah, so that, that's very interesting. So people generally are very impatient. And what do I mean is time Wine needs time, and people tend to drink wine far too early. Right away, yes. <laughs> so, right. So, like, for instance, two, 2016 was a five-star Barolo vintage, one of the best in the past, past 50 years, right? 
many people will buy 2016 Barolos and they drink them right away. And they're fine to drink right away because they're well, they're well made, you know, but the wines are out of balance. So wines need time. And the only way that people learn and we educate people about wine is to drink verticals. What is a vertical? A vertical is a wine from the same vineyard by the same maker in different years. So a vertical, let's say, of Barolo from 2016, 14, 12, and let's say you get 10 vintages and you go back 20 years, because a good Barolo should last a minimum of 20 years in a good vintage, right? So a person needs to be able, and very few people are able to do this, taste a vertical of wine so they understand the aging component of wine and what happens, right? So in a Barolo, early on, they're very tannic. Tannins you taste <coughs> in the back of your mouth, on the sides of your tongue. The fruit is not so prevalent and they're overpowering, right? As wines age, Barolo, Bordeaux, Burgundy, those tannins soften, the fruit comes fo forward, the acidity kind of fades a bit, and the wine becomes in balance, right? So we look for that balance in wine. So we like to buy great vintages, but we also like to buy vertical selections so people have an opportunity to drink older wines, right? With older wines comes a price, right? Because it's all about time. Where do you mm -hmm. store them? How much does it cost to store them, right? Time equals money. So we try to buy vintages that we can put away and offer people values down the road. So we, we put away some 2016 vintages. So we have some on our list and we have some in the cellar that we'll put on, we'll release again in four years or six years or eight years or 10 years. And we bought them at the right price so we can, we can provide an opportunity for a, a decent value to our consumer. So really when building a wine list, you, you have to go to the great places, right? So on an Italian wine list, you have to have Brunello de Montalcino. You have to have Chianti Classico. You have to have Barolo. You have to have Barbaresco. I think you have to have the wines of Mount Etna. You have to have the white wines of Trentino Alto Adige and, Fri and, Fri and Friuli, the great wine producing regions. You have to have the middle regions. I think you have to have Sagrantino from Umbria, right? So you have to be representative of the great varietals that grow throughout Italy. Do you have to have every? No, there's too many. And then for a great Italian list, you have to have some obscure. You have to have Frippato, right? You have to have Pecorino, a white, a great white from Le Marche, right? You have to have wines that are known in Italy like Verdicchio that are not so known in the United States. I'm a surprise effect. <laughs> right? You have to reintroduce wines like Suave that were ruined by Bola Suave that were mass produced, where you have producers like Pirapon and Inama producing great Suave wines that are, are becoming, you know, the best white wine of Italy for, for you know, 2016. So are re receiving great accol accolades, but often overlooked in America because they had a, there was a bad interpretation in the 60s and 17s with Suave Bola, right? So we have to re-educate people on those great wines. So it's hitting, hitting the great growing regions and then some of those obscure for education. Definitely, thank you very much for all this uh, fantastic conversation about uh, really Italian food and wine uh, from an Italian perspective about the restaurant industry, uh, the wine market. Uh, the, the food industry and the elements that make the Italian wine distinctive. And in, in this last um, things that you are saying, uh, what creates value in, in, in a wine, which is time, history, the making, the freshness, the terroir, but also a value that um, must be matched by a monetary value, which also relates to the amount of time that passes between, or when you buy and when you sell the, the actual bottle, which is not just a fantastic product but it's also a piece uh, in, in the market uh, so thank you very much for uh, this wonderful conversation it was really a pleasure to have you in the show uh, it's, always, it's always a pleasure to see you 
anytime you want to talk about food and wine, you, you know that I'm always available. And definitely, I invite you to follow the uh, Facebook Live at noon on Friday on Birra Vino that you're yes. doing presenting the um, wine uh, makers, wine producers from Italy. And what's your, what's your, what's your uh, tag? So if I see a sign in, I'll give you a wave. Is it Luca Cotini? Luca Cotini, Italian Innovators. Okay. Uh, so, we'll give uh, you a shout out. Perfect. Thanks for listening and make sure to visit the official uh, webpage of the show at Italian, www.italianinnovators.com for more information about the project and to sign up to receive the newsletter. Um, also, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel and subscribe for more video content and the lessons of the Italian Innovators course. Uh, you can also follow me on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for updates, news, news and additional materials. Uh, Thanks as always for your support. Arrivederci e alla prossima. Yeah.